Hello, and thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, to join us for this event, exploring the lived impact of the Holocaust on the second generation, healing and resilience. My name is Bob Earlwine. I'm a professor of religious studies in the Department of History and Philosophy, and I'm the director of the Eastern Michigan University Center for Jewish Studies. I'd like, oh. <laughs> ah. I'd like to begin with a thank you for the musical accompaniment. Um, I would like to thank the foundation for its fundraising efforts on our behalf. It makes events like this possible. Uh, tonight, this event is co-sponsored by the psychology department at Eastern Michigan University and the Ann Arbor Ort America chapter. A little bit of housekeeping uh, before we begin the introduction. If you're an undergraduate seeking LBC credit, you should have seen Theodore on your way in and provided your EID. If you did not, please do so after the event. Uh, for those of you um, from the community, we have parking vouchers. Uh, to, to, so please come see me after the event and I can get you a voucher to cover your parking. Now, it is really my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers who are all contributors to the volume, The Ones Who Remember, Second Generation Voices of the Holocaust, uh, which was published in 2022 by City Points Press. Oh, and, and one is also the editor, uh, or an editor. So I first learned of this book when the Center for Jewish Studies was looking to sponsor a book for the 2022 Ann Arbor Jewish Book Festival. And at that point, you're just looking at kind of rows of really impressive looking books, but we picked this one to sponsor because the topic of it, the intergenerational trauma of the Holocaust as expressed by children of survivors was so interesting. And because for the second reason, the contributors to the volume were locals. They were residing in Southeast Michigan and the Center for Jewish Studies always work, has always worked very hard to engage our local and regional communities. That was before I read the book. When I read the book, I have to say I was absolutely spellbound. I was so glad this was the volume we, we sponsored. Uh, as a professor of Jewish studies, I teach, write, and read a lot having to do with the Holocaust. I've, I've read around and about the Holocaust a great deal. And I have to say, I had never encountered a work like this before. It, it's quite remarkable. Um, additionally, given that the psychology department is our co-sponsor tonight, I'm pleased to say that two of the speakers here, Dr. Rita Ben and Dr. Fran Louis Berg are clinical psychologists. The other speaker, Avishai Hayut, is also in healthcare, is a, is a physical therapist. So all of our speakers, both in terms of their biographies, but also their professions are, are well poised to speak to us about trauma, but also resilience and healing. Before I turn things over to our panelists though, I would like to first welcome Joan Levitt, president of the Ann Arbor Ort America chapter to say a few words. Hi, I'm Joan Levitt, president of the Ann Arbor chapter of Ort America. And our chapter is one of the co-sponsors of this event tonight. Ort has been at work around the world since its founding in 1880. Or it has schools and programs in 42 countries, helping more than 200,000 people every year. Ort's work has always been helping students to succeed in worthwhile careers. Today, the emphasis is on high quality STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Ort's programs are based on three pillars, education for life, 
global citizenship, preparing students to lead socially responsible lives, and Jewish experience, ensuring Jewish continuity by enriching Jewish education, identity, and appreciation of Jewish traditions and culture. Ord has schools in the former Soviet Union, Europe, Latin America, and Israel. One important focus for Ord right now is its schools in Ukraine, where there are almost 4,000 students and 300 teachers. Besides providing education, Ord is working to provide humanitarian aid, including food, transportation, and medication for its students and their families, and is supporting Ord schools and other countries that receive refugees. The Ann Arbor chapter of Ord raises money for Ord's important programs. We also have a book group where we discuss books with Jewish and or Jewish content and or authors that has been operating for more than 20 years. And we have a monthly film discussion group. On the table where you signed in, there's a handout about ORT in our chapter. Please take one if you're interested and consider joining ORT. Thank you. And here's our program. Thank you. Um, I'm Rita Ben, uh, and one of the co-editors and a contributing author to our book. And I want to thank Bob and uh, Joan um, for inviting us to give this presentation today. My mother, who was a Holocaust survivor, actually was very active in ORT um, and in raising money. She took a lot of pride in being able to um, support that organization. Um, our plan for today is that each one of the authors will talk to you a little bit very briefly about what their parents' experience was during the war, and then we'll share an excerpt from the book. And then afterwards, we'll invite um, the audience, students and ORT members and our TBE supporters um, to ask questions um, that they, you might have about the second generation experience. Um, but before we begin, I wanna tell you a little bit about how this book first came to be. Uh, there are 16, there were 16 uh, active members that belonged to Temple Beth Emmeth uh, in Ann Arbor who were ch uh, adult children of Holocaust survivors. And over the years, uh, we, be, we were writing services for our congregation on Yom HaShoah Day, which is a national day of remembrance for Holocaust survivors, and also for Yom Kippur. Sorry, it's like a Too loud? No, no, it's, it, it has a boom. An echo? Yeah. A boom. Um, how's that? Is that okay? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so what we found um, when we were sharing our, uh, so these services contain stories of our parents' experience because we wanted to bring um, both that history to life uh, for our congregants. And we also included, of course, poems and liturgy. And, and we've been doing this since 2004. And we found that every year, our congregation members were very moved by the experience. And even, in fact, um, our previous cantor said that this was the most moving service that she ever attended. Um, and so because of that impact, we thought, gee, we should share these stories more broadly. And we worked together for about five years trying to pull um, these stories into a book. And, when we approached an editor uh, with a draft of our manuscript, she said to us, well, that's interesting. Um, interesting is always an interesting word, right? You don't know exactly what that means. But she said, um, there wasn't really a market, and she was very kind. There wasn't really a market anymore for Holocaust memoirs. There were a lot of stories already that have been written by survivors, and she didn't mean it in any pejorative way. Um, and she asked instead, she said, but I didn't hear your voice in there. What was it like for you to grow up in families um, whose parents survived the Holocaust? And that's what she thought our readers would be most interested to learn about. So we went back to our group and we said, um, well, this is what the editors say. Um, is anybody willing to take a deeper dive and to introspect a little bit more on what that experience was like? And it was interesting, although we had been meeting for uh, 16 or 20 years to prepare services, we had never really talked that intimately about what the experience was like for our, in our own families. 
uh, we talked a lot about our parents and we shared similarities of some of, of their, um, uh, their strengths and their foibles, so to speak, and, and some of the stories, but not about what it was like intimately for us. Um, so all the authors, actually, all our members in our group decided that they were willing to do it. And then um, thus we have this book. So we hope that the stories that you'll hear tonight and in reading the book will inspire you um, to want to learn more, to um, see the strengths that came out from um, our lived experience. And, um, and uh, we offer this as a legacy. Uh, the other legacy we wanna share with you too, and while, we're, while I have the podium, I'll make a plug. Um, on April 15th, we are going to be ho hosting event at Temple Beth Emmet uh, in honor of Irene Butter, who has, is a Holocaust survivor, uh, an author, a humanitarian, a former professor of health economics at the U of M. Um, we created a legacy fund for her so that we could then be able in the future to offer community-wide grants to support the education of the Holocaust and human and, and, um, and issues related to uh, othering that occurs in our community. We are bringing in Ruth Messenger, who was the uh, ex first executive director of the American or president of the American Jewish World Service, which was an organization that was dedicated to supporting the human rights of peoples in the developing world. So there's a flyer outside. I, I encourage you to take a flyer, uh, buy a ticket to come to our event and, and donate so that we can have this uh, legacy that will outlive you know, all of us in, in our book. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Avishai Hayut. Maybe now? Okay. Um, is it still okay, this far? Okay, good. So um, <clears throat> a little closer, okay, good, okay. Um, first of all, just a little background of where am I from and where my parents came from. I, I was born in Israel in uh, 1957, about 12 years after the Holocaust. Both my parents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, my mother was in Poland she was a, a, a young girl, was saved by in a, in a convent. Her mother had uh, arranged for false identification as her, being her as an, uh, an orphan. And um, she was put in a convent. And after the war, my grandmother came and picked her up. Um, my father was in the Vilnius get, ghetto um, with his father, mother, and his brother. Both his mother and brother were taken, and you'll hear that in my story. Um, he survived with his father. Um, after the Holocaust, my mother's mother and my father's father uh, ways crossed in the train station while looking for family, relatives, survivors. They met each other. My mother's mother and my father's father got married with my mother being the younger child, my father eight and a half years older. So they, before they became, became my parents, they were uh, step brother and sister. Um, that's that's the story in, in a nutshell. I moved to the United States around uh, 1987 and was in the East Coast for a long while. And then we moved to Ann Arbor because of my wife's uh, new job as the cantor in, in, in this synagogue. So I was lucky to join this group with a little bit of a pressure on my my wife and I have, I have really not regretted a moment of it. So uh, um, it's been a life-changing experience for me as well. So 
Um, let me read a little bit from my chapter and, and then give the rest to talk. So my chapter opens by, the, the opening is, it recently dawned on me that we might think of the of Kristallnacht as a metaphor for the lives of the second generation children of survivors. Kristallnacht, the night of the shattered glass, ha happened in November 9th and 10th of the year 1938. It spread its virulence across Nazi Germany and during that horrific event, Jewish establishment, including stores, schools, hospitals, and synagogues were attacked by German paramilitary and members of the Nazi party. Glass was shattered everywhere and fires were set to destroy heaps of books and sacred Jewish scrolls along with buildings. This was the thunder and lightning before the storm of what we call now the Holocaust. When we try to uncover the hidden stories of our family's experiences during and after this calamity, it's like trying to excavate the archeological artifacts of our parents' silence. Just as the shards of glass cannot be put back together and the burned pages of books cannot make whole books again, we can never recover the whole truth of what happened to our family members lost during the Holocaust. In some cases, even those who survived took their secrets with them to their graves, trying to protect themselves from relieving this horrific time, as well as protecting their families from hearing these stories. Yet, those of us who came after feel comp compelled to seek or to unearth their stories from the broken glass and sh shard, shard embers, even though we may become scarred with emotional cuts and burns too. The past Holocaust Memorial Day, my sister asked if any of us, my mother, my brother, or myself, remember the name of our father, father's brother, whom we'd never met. He had been killed at the age of 10, shot with his mother by the Nazis as they were rounding up women and children as one of the final cleansing actions of the Vilnius ghetto. To whom do we refer when we have no name? I remember seeing the picture of my father's mother and brother in my parents' bedroom under the mirror. Uh, they, it, the, it was a black and white picture with almost, the faces was, were almost expressionless. I think it, I, 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 when I was there last time when I visited my mother, it no longer is there and I was searching for it, but I could not find it. I do not, do not recall my father ever sa saying his brother's name. If we ever even asked in the Jewish tradition, you name someone after a relative who has been, who has died. My poor uncle has no one named after him. His name is lost in the ether of a dark history. Now a little bit about a, lot, a little picture from another part of my, my story about my father. My father was a real Litvak. This is a term used pejoratively to describe someone from Lithuania who likes to argue for the sake of argument. My father and my grandfather were both hot tempered. At the age of two and a half, I remember my grandpa 
cursing me in Russian when I accidentally broke something in his apartment. My grandfather and father also constantly fought whenever they were together. In fact, my father was always getting into arguments with everybody because he felt he was always being wronged. I remember periods of time when he wouldn't talk to neighbors, friends, even the grocer. Eventually, and, 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 and at the end, he didn't even remember what was he, you know, fighting with them for. Eventually he forgot and was not angry anymore. Our friends, members of our community were understanding and willing to forgive his anger. I assume that was because at the end of the day, they saw something good in him and appreciated him. I saw it too, the caring and the help he jumped to give me, even though it was hard to internalize that because I felt bombarded by his negativity. I was often the one who bore the brunt of his wrath. Looking back on the time with benefits of years of therapy, I think the shadow of my father's brother's death, the survival guilt and the reversal in caretaking he took on with his father as the war progressed probably played into the intensity of my father's grandfather and my father and grandfather's dynamic. While they each may have had some innate tendency to react more angrily than most, I think their anger became exacerbated and more ingrained as a result of the inhumane conditions and fears of imminent death they experienced during the Holocaust, as well as the subsequent difficulties of everyday life in Israel, which was quite hard at that time. They moved to Israel 1950. It was 1948 that the state of, of Israel was, uh, uh, the state of Israel started. So it was hard life then. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll give a friend now to, to tell her story. Thank you very much, Adisha. So I was born in Montreal. I was raised in Montreal. I came to Ann Arbor for graduate school. When it was time to write my doctoral dissertation, I picked the topic of children of the Holocaust. And when I told my father, he bellowed, I forbid it. Then that's my story that I was, they were silenced. They wanted my silence, my brother's silence. And I had resistance to looking into the Holocaust because that was in my bones. You were not supposed to look into it. You're not supposed to talk or ask or learn about it. And writing this, this chapter actually changed my life. And I didn't know going into it how much of an impact it would have on me. And I just wanna express my appreciation for everybody being here, your interest in the book and your bearing witness to our stories. Um, that's what it's all about. That's about never, never forgetting, never again. So thank you for your presence. Uh, a little bit about my parents. They were born in the small town of Yaroslav, Poland, and they knew each other as children growing up before the war. My mother was 16 and my father 18 when the war broke out. Both were in forced labor camps during the war, my mother in Poland and my father in Siberia. My mother's sister, young niece, um, survived the war, as did my father's mother. Everyone else in their families perished. My parents immigrated to Montreal after the war, and they had nothing but the two gold coins that were sewn into the waistband of my father's pants. Out of the ashes, my parents established lives for themselves that were meaningful and rich. 
going to read you a couple of excerpts to give you a flavor of what it was like growing up with my parents. The first excerpt is called Heaping Piles of, of Food. Even though my parents tried to shield us from the Holocaust, they were constantly providing us with its lessons. One such lesson was the preciousness of food. My mother would tell the story of going into Steinberg's, one of Montreal's largest grocery stores, for the first time after leaving Europe. Row upon row of canned goods, meats, savories, heaping piles of fresh fruit and vegetables, endless food as far as her eyes could see. She took in the abundance and wept. Even when my parents were financially successful, my mother could not throw out food. She consumed stale bread. She encouraged me to eat the fat on my steak. When my brother turned 13, he implored my father to raise his allowance by 25 cents. My father flatly refused. Jules proclaimed he would not eat until my father changed his mind. This was probably the worst form of protest you could have devised for a Holocaust survivor. My father was incensed. How could Jules take food for granted? His response to my brother's hunger strike was to deny him and raise my allowance by a quarter. As far as I can recall, that's one of the meaning, the most meaning, most mean things he ever did. The only way I can understand it is that in this moment, the cruelty once directed at him was transformed into a harshness that he inflicted on his son. Many years later, when showing my husband and me our prenatal ultrasound, the ob -GYN commented lightly that the fetus's stomach was full. My satisfaction was immense. As empty nesters, there are just two of us at home now, yet my fridge is full to brimming. When I entertain, there's enough food left over for a second gathering. I unconsciously but routinely leave a tiny amount of beverage in my glass. I imagine this is just to be sure I have some for later to ensure that I do not run out. The second excerpt that I'm going to share with you, also giving you a flavor of what I grew up with, um, has to do with the sins of being late. Penny was the tallest girl in our seventh grade class. I was the shortest. She was as big boned as I was slight. She had fashion sense. I had none. We were mistaken more than once for mother and daughter, which pleased her no end and embarrassed me to death. However, in Penny's presence, I just laughed it off, like, isn't that hysterical? Because I was that cool. Our ritual after school was to go to Woolworths and see and be seen by as many kids we knew as possible sit in our favorite booth with the orange vinyl seating and eat french fries with vinegar because that's the way you eat french fries if you live in Quebec. One day I accompanied Penny back to her house so I could admire the clothes her aunt had bought her in yet another shopping extravaganza. I was doing the obligatory ooing and aahing when her mother came down and announced in a nervous voice that my mother had called. I was to go straight home. I knew I was in trouble. My mother was in our kitchen, beside herself with why was I so late? She was shaking and carrying on as if I had done something criminal. I eventually gathered that she had gotten a hold of my personal phone book and had systematically called all my friends and acquaintances in a desperate attempt to find me. Mortified, I hollered, how could you? It makes me look so stupid. It makes me look like a baby. How could you do such a stupid, stupid thing? My father grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me into the hallway 
My mother's expression had gone blank. My father said to me, after looking at me gravely, he delivered the stinging message. Mommy's experience during the war was that if someone was five minutes late, you never saw them again. I had committed the gravest sin, the violation of my code to never add to my parents' suffering, but I was only 12. Couldn't I just be mad at my mother having embarrassed me? Couldn't I just stamp my feet at the unfairness of it all? No, that was a luxury I did not have. When would I have suffered enough for people to protect me, to avoid hurting me at all costs, to make it their goal to not disappoint me and make me happy? It was not until I suffered my own, suffered my own emotional crisis and experience of depression so debilitating that I had to leave graduate school and return to my parents' home, that I realized the answer to that question, never. It will never be my turn. For years, I carried on a heated debate with myself. What did I owe my parents and what did they owe me? For the longest time, I struggled to figure out whose needs were greater, whose rights more legitimate, I wrestled with whether I should side with my parents' needs or my own. The heat of that debate eventually transformed into sorrow. As I left the self-centered world of adolescence, I could begin to put myself in my parents' heavy shoes. As I look back on that scene in our kitchen of an emotionally wrought mother and her enraged daughter, I feel waves of sorrow for them both. Thank you, Fran. Maybe we need to take a deep breath after listening to Fran's stories. I practice mindfulness meditation, so that's why I'm fighting through the, <laughs> to just do that. Um, my parents were both Holocaust survivors. Uh, they, my mother was born in Odessa, Ukraine, and my father was born in Moscow, uh, but they were raised in Vilnius in Lithuania. And uh, they didn't, they, they knew each other uh, a little bit during adolescence, um, but both of them went off to college uh, in Belgium. And when the war broke out, um, they were had already been dating, um, although my mother said that she had a few bows and wasn't necessarily the, he wasn't necessarily the one she was sure about. Um, they returned back to Lithuania. Their parents had said, don't come home because they were, they were worried that they wouldn't be able to get out. Um, but both of them were very devoted to their families and they left. And as a result, they were stuck there. Um, they were imprisoned in the ghetto. And um, in 1944, um, they were transported to concentration camps. They were the last uh, deportation before Vilnius was liberated three weeks later. Um, my mother's mother got claustrophobia uh, in the bunker in which they were hiding. She ran out. My mother ran after her. My father ran after her. And they were caught. Um, so my mother was sent to Stratov, which was a, uh, primarily a work labor camp. And my father was sent to Dachau, which was uh, next to Auschwitz, apparently the second worst concentration camp. Um, of the 32 relatives that my parents had, it was just my mother who survived my father, a little cousin that my mother saved during the war, which you'll have to read my book, our book to find out the story behind that. And uh, my mother's sister, who was a partisan and fought in the woods with the Russians uh, against the Nazis. My parents, after the war, um, went back to Belgium. They, they found, of course, they found each other. And again, that's another wonderful story. And um, my mother supported my father while he finished his engineering degree in Belgium. And then um, they emigrated to Canada, to Montreal as well. 
And although Fran and I are both from Montreal, we didn't know each other until college. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to read um, two excerpts from my chapter, but they sort of flow right after each other. So um, I'll just continue. Uh, on June 21st, 1969, the phone rang at 6 a.m. to inform our family that my father, Philip Allen Ben, had died at 51 years of age. I was 16. Only three and a half weeks earlier, he had been admitted to the hospital to investigate unexplained abdominal pain he'd been experiencing for several months. Cause of death? The doctor said cancer, metastasized to the liver. What did my mother say? Dachau. My father was extremely ill upon liberation from Dachau. At five foot, 11 inches, he weighed only 75 pounds, and he had to spend three months in recovery at a hospital where he almost died. The beatings and the lack of food, freezing winter without heat or clothing, chemicals emitted from the gassing, and disease from the corpses around him may well have taken a long-term toll on his body. Perhaps, my mother thought, his overindulgence with sweets and excess second helpings and preferences for filet mignon and other red meat and rich sauces was a reaction to his deprivation and contributed to the rise of his cancer. More likely, I believe she saw his workaholic behavior, the 60 hour work week he regularly put in to build his engineering firm and the pressures that led to his quick temper and inability to compromise as the main culprit. With no financial resources after the war, he felt driven to achieve and attain the level of wealth that he had growing up and which had been taken away from him. Dachau, with its attendant loss and victimization, set the course for his premature death. Each of the three times I have visited the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, I've stood transfixed watching the video footage documenting Dachau's liberation. No matter how improbable it would be to see my father, my eyes would search over and over again for an image that resembled him. I wasn't sure if I could recognize him among the walking dead. He was 27 years old when on April 29th, 1945, the three US Army divisions converged to liberate Dachau. 33 years later, on that very same day, I gave birth to my first son, David, who of my three wonderful children feels the pull of this ancestral lineage most strongly. I'm intrigued by the mystery of that connection. When I read about the 2015 United States Holocaust Memorial Museum gathering, I imagined what it might be like to attend. Could I learn anything about my father's experience by talking to another Dachau survivor or a soldier who liberated the camp. For several years, I had been part of a training program to teach US Army personnel mental resilience skills. This work had been in small measure, my way of giving back to those unknown soldiers who freed my father and to whom I indirectly owe my life. On May 4th of that same year, my husband and I were at a party celebrating the engagement of our middle son, Jeremy, to his sweetheart, Catherine Byrne Dugan. We sat in the garden of their family home, talking with her parents, an 89-year-old Irish Catholic grandfather, Art. I was careful not to broach any details about the upcoming wedding. Catherine had converted to Judaism several years before she met my son, and she warned me that it still might be a touchy subject for her pop-up. Our garden co conversation turned to discussing my need for a new car. I said I wouldn't consider purchasing any vehicle made in Germany out of respect for my parents' suffering. My parents never allowed the purchase of German goods in their home. 
Catherine's mother informed me quietly that Art had been in the army during the war and that he too never allowed German merchandise in their home. She motioned, she motioned to Art to come over and told him, pop up, Jeremy's mom won't buy anything German. Her parents were in a concentration camp during the war. He nodded silently. I said, did you see any of the camps? And then I quickly added, my mother was at Stutthof and my father was at Dachau. Art hesitated. And when he began speaking, he averted his eyes from mine. Our unit went to Dachau. I will always remember that smell. When they gave us the assignment, we thought we were going to, to transport some prisoners out of jail. I had just been shipped overseas a few weeks earlier. I was 17. I knew nothing about the camps or really about war. On our way to Dachau, there was this terrible stench. He paused for a moment. Catherine's mother whispered to me that Art had refused to ever talk about his wartime experiences. This was the first time. I couldn't believe what we saw when we arrived, he said. Dead bodies lying everywhere. You stepped over the corpses like they were roadkill. And those alive, I won't ever forget what they look like. I don't care what the German people say. The townspeople definitely knew what was going on inside that camp. With that smell, there was no way not to know. I nodded in agreement. I knew about the complicity of silence and the pain it held for my own mother. Hearing this eyewitness account, I cringed, not just for the suffering of the victims of my father and my mother, but also for that young boy inside of Arch. I can only imagine, Art, how hard that must have been for you as a 17-year-old, green from Philadelphia, to face that horror. My mother told me how kind my father found the American soldiers who liberated the camp. I want to thank you for your service. I paused for a moment to allow him to take in what, what I said. Isn't it amazing, Art? I continued. If it weren't for you and your troop, in all likelihood, we wouldn't be here today celebrating Jeremy and Catherine's engagement. A faint smile came to his lips. Art went on to talk more about his wartime experiences while Catherine's parents sat motionless, rapt, and grateful to hear him share what he'd never spoken before. I was only half listening. My mind was filled with just one word, grace. Thank you. So we've got time for some questions uh, from the audience. I'll be coming around with uh, a microphone. Thank you very much for your presentations. They're very moving and beautifully written. So um, I had a couple questions and they aren't necessarily related or can be. One is um, I thought of it, um, Abishai, when you were talking about, Abishai, I'm sorry, um, talking about not naming anyone after your uncle. And I wondered about your experiences with children who are named for the family members who had passed, perished in the Holocaust and what that, how that affected them. Um, and the other question I have is since you all have children is that next generation and if you can reflect at all on how this has impacted them. Um, and now there's yet another generation that for some of you that are coming up, but particularly the, the generation after you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Very interesting question. Um, I, I don't recall anybody, and there were plenty of uh, second generation uh, when I grew up in Israel. Um, but I do not recall right now anybody that was called or named after after a, a you know relative that expired that, that died in the Holocaust. If I have to speculate why, it is within the same realm of not wanting to maybe relieve the life and remember every day, even though my name, Avishai is father's gift, so I was named as a father's gift from my mother's father. But in a sense, you know, to have a picture of someone with, with the name of someone who has died, maybe would have been a little bit too painful to experience again and again. Um, the other question that you asked was, Second generation, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would re read you, the, you know, it's 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 fraught. The, the end of my chapter <clears throat> has my son's <clears throat> poem. I would recommend that you read the poem because it shows the effect of the Holocaust on him. I would volunteer to say it, and it's in my chapter, that I have repeated some of my father's mistakes in rearing me up when I was young. Yeah, I could not detach myself from my, especially my older son, in the need to have him do expect him to, you know, achieve more and, and to, to, you know, come to the, you know, the tradition of a successful, and I was always worried be, about him, you know, not achieving that because of his ADHD and stuff like that. So um, read the chapter, you'll have more answers about that. Um, so I'd like to address the second question about 2G. Um, you know, I was, angry for a while at my parents for not sharing their experience. They deprived me of my history. I had to imagine the worst. Um, they were protecting me. They're also protecting themselves. But what's interesting is I noticed I don't want my daughter to be affected by the Holocaust. They so desperately didn't want us to be affected. And I don't want my granddaughter to be affected by the Holocaust. But on top of that, I actually do want them to be because I want them to be very aware about discrimination and social injustice. And um, I think the lessons of the Holocaust that hit second generation and will hit third generation also speak to that. Um, my daughter, she, she shows signs to me that she's 3G. And one of those is um, when we travel, upon arrival, she insists that we let her know that we got there. And I think that's somewhat related to her grandparents. My parents were tragically killed in a car crash, but it's also related to Holocaust and loss. And the other thing she did that was so interesting to me that I did as well during COVID when there was this forced separation it wasn't logical, but I had this sense that I would never see her, her husband, and my granddaughter again. And it turned out that she had a similar fear. She thought we would die before she could see us again. And um, that's the impact that, you know, in the Holocaust, when there was separation, that often meant death, that you would never see somebody again. And she carries some anxiety, my daughter. And she also has a sense of, she said this somewhat embarrassed, embarrassedly to me, that she feels special about being 3G, that she has these ties to something so important. She's very Jewish identified. And I think that has some roots in the Holocaust. 
She was the regional leader of Michigan um, Reformed um, Jewish Youth, and she's on her temple board. She wears a mug and dove it around her neck. Her daughter wears a mug and dove it around her neck. I write in my chapter that that was the last thing um, my mother would have wanted, you know, for my daughter to proclaim her Jewishness and her great granddaughter proclaim her Jewishness. Um, she sings the Shema to my granddaughter, Ruth, as her lullaby at night. So she is very Jewish identified, and I think that has its roots in the Holocaust. Um, so I'll just speak a little bit to that first question about being named after um, a person who died in the Holocaust. So I was named after my father's sister. Um, she was killed, as I shared with you earlier, when my mother chased her mother, et cetera. Um, the, my father's sister and his parents were hiding in the bunker and the Nazis burned the ghetto to the ground. And so she was 20. Um, so uh, I, brought, I knew that story very probably when I was about eight or 10 that I was named after my father's sister who uh, died in the war. You know, that, that's how our parents used to talk to us. They died in the war. If you ever asked anything, how exactly they skirted around, you know, that kind of issue. Um, and I knew that my father uh, felt very close to his sister. Um, but for me, I was uh, worried as a child that I was going to die when I turned 20, no matter how irrational that was. And I remember at my 21st birthday, just having a wonderful drink um, uh, and celebrating life because I had survived. So that was something that was very deep inside of me. And um, I had talked with my husband that when we had children, I really didn't want to name them after any relatives who died because of that impact that it had on me. I didn't think of it in terms of being an honor. And I also used to wonder, you know, did my father feel sad when he used to call me? And we had a very close, uh, intense relationship um, you know, while growing up, but, you know, I don't, I, you know, these are the thoughts that go through a child's mind. Um, so I couldn't name my children after and my husband agreed um, after anyone who had died. And then when my son had his first child, they decided to name uh, their daughter after my mother. And I was just, you know, feeling so grateful that they did that. So it's just interesting, you know, how that came around that um, that they could give this sort of legacy of strength and resilience that um, to my granddaughter. Uh, and then there's a really interesting story when we talk about fourth generation, you know, this fourth generation. Um, so that family also has my son also has twins that are almost going to be five and they love the sound of music. And these, and the parents are pretty protective. You know, they don't let the kids even watch the Dalmatians. You know, on you know Cruella de Vil is too scary for them, so they're very careful. But they decide, okay, they're going to watch the Sound of Music a little bit because the, the children love the songs. And um, the um, Arthur, who's named after the grandfather, and he's four and a half, saw uh, in that scene where the they're singing the um, goodbye song and, and a Nazi comes in and they go, hi, Hitler. So he's into playing Spider-Man and throwing his webs. So he starts imitating hi, Hitler in, the, in their home. And they are freaked out, like, oh my God, that's all he has to do is like go to school and start doing hi, Hitler all around. And so they got a little bit tongue-tied in trying to explain you know, why he shouldn't do that. And they told a little bit too much of the story and about that my that my um, my mother has uh, you know survived the war and that he was a terrible man, et cetera, et cetera. So the twins um, wrote cards to me telling me how sorry they were that Hitler had done those terrible things during the war. Um, so it's just interesting just to see how how legacy gets transmitted in different ways and we don't know what impact that will have. The research does seem to show though that there is a greater level of anxiety in the third generation of, um, you know, in terms of our kids versus us. Yeah. 
I've heard all of you speak before and I've read the book. And when I read about the effect on your childhood of your parents' terrible suffering, um, I feel pain too because a child shouldn't have to. But I'd like you to talk about resilience. Um, you seem to be functioning well, as far as I know. And how did you move beyond your childhood fears and the treatment that you didn't understand or the message you never heard? Um, I, us, you know, every family is different. So, you know, I think I wanted to say that. And in my particular family, um, I would say that I felt very, very safe for the most part and very loved. And I think that is the roots, that is the root kind of, of feeling more secure and strong as a person. And I also saw, you know, my parents, um, uh, they were very, very generous in giving to the Jewish community. I saw also um, the strength of my mother, really, in, in number one, having to put up with a patriarchal husband in, in the way that in the way that she had in the way that she did, but also in her, um, you know, her resilience of adapting to another country, first Belgium and then then Canada, and not having any family. Um, there wasn't a pervasive sense of sadness, I'll say, at all in my parents while I was growing up. That sense of sadness came much more after my father died and my mother experienced that loss, his loss, and, um, and then her subsequent uh, issues in health. Um, so I'll, I'll attribute, you know, my really my resilience, you know, to the way in which I felt um, uh, loved and cared for and encouraged. And, uh, you know, contrary to how we, I'll say our generation is coddling, has coddled our children or are more helicopter-like, um, my our parents were not like that. You know, they trusted that we had also, you know, the skills to do things independently and, um, and they gave us, you know, um, and I was fortunate enough to be privileged to be given a lot of resources. So that's how, you know, from my own experience. So it's a wonderful question. When you look at our group, our 2G group, we're a bunch of overachievers. We're a bunch of people who have been very su successful at the business of living. And um, our parents, for the most part, were successful at the business of living too. My mother had tremendous joie de vivre. My father outside of the home, not inside of the home. Inside of the home, there was more signs of depression. My father was successful at what he did, um, became a leader in the Jewish community, founded a center in Israel for, it's called the Louis um, Youth Center for disadvantaged Palestinian and Jewish youth. Um, they showed me resilience. What could be more resilient than making it through the war and leading, make, creating rich lives for themselves? So I speak of my parents as bent, but not broken. Um, resilience is a fascinating thing when you think about the Holocaust, because mostly people think about post-traumatic stress disorder. And now there's a realization and a growing interest in post-traumatic growth. And resilience is one of those things. There are other things like increased compassion, increased empathy. Um, writing this book made me more appreciative of my parents and more accepting of them, of them and myself. Um, but resilience and perseverance and accomplishment and lovingness those were things that I attribute to the way I was raised and to my parents. So in the end, with all of their flaws, they were quite heroic. First of all, I would not recommend to go through the Holocaust to be achievers like us, okay? Um, I, uh, I think it's, it has left, in, in Israel, there is a, there is a word which says saut. Saut means someone who's scratched. And someone who's scratched means someone who's been scratched emotionally. And it's a scratch that you cannot take away from yourself. So 
being an overachiever is one thing um, about us. I think the other common th thing between all of us, not all of us, uh, a large amount, is that we have chosen to be in the health, as was said, uh, in the healthcare profession, dealing with helping healing other people. We felt that because we were dealt, maybe <laughs> it's a, you know, just a psychological analysis, but maybe we, because we were scratched, maybe we know better how to help people who are scratched too physically or emotionally. So that's, you know, that's my five cents on that. All right. I just wanted to add one thing that I think our parents needed us to be successful, needed us to be strong, needed us to be happy. And boy, was it our mission, certainly was my mission um, to make up to them for what they suffered. And when I wasn't happy, that was not okay. It was not okay. I didn't get to be unhappy. I remember com not complaining. My, my father and my brother used to go at it. They would just lock horns and I couldn't understand it because didn't he understand we were supposed to make up to my parents, not cause them aggravation. Um, and I said to my mother, I was seven, I said, things aren't very happy at home. And she looked at me with barely contained fury and said, you have no right. She said, you have a, a roof over your head, you have food to eat, you have parents who love you. You know, it was this sort of, how dare you? And I never repeated anything like that again. They needed us to be strong. They needed us to be successful. They needed us to be resilient. And I think it, it was certainly my mission to show them I was going to live life fully for them. Time for one more question. I was just kind of curious, in Montreal, did they have a community of other um, Holocaust survivor families? And did they seek that out, your folks? Very much so. okay. I assume <laughs> that was the case in Israel, but maybe I'm wrong. So one of the questions that I keep thinking about as I'm listening to you is, how are you and your families dealing with this uprise of anti-Semitism? What do, you, what do you make of it and how does it affect you? Um, I'll just say that I'm happy that my parents aren't alive to see that. Um, although, and I will say that, um, and my mother always said that this can happen again. That was a message that I heard. Um, in our group, there are some people that have been very fearful, more fearful than one might expect, you know, from a normal, I will say, Jewish person, <laughs> you know, a person who didn't have that kind of background. It's exacerbated. Um, and it's for me, it's just very sad to see this. Um, and also, I think that um, as a human species, <laughs> uh, we, we tend to, um, to treat, we need to treat sort of others um, not, not us, but I'm saying there's a group of people who need to treat others in a very derogatory way in order for them to feel better about themselves. And I think that's, you know, I wish the world was different and I wish we were different. Um, yeah, so it's sad to see, but I, I can't say for myself that um, I'm fearful. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, as a community and as a, that there will be ways um, in this world where we can bond with other minorities um, to be, feel strong for one another so that we can um, educate other people and um, reduce kind of the um, potential um, meanness that is that is occurring. Growing up, part of the way that I dealt with the fact that my parents had gone through the Holocaust was to believe, and I believed this to way too, too, till way too old, that it could never happen here. 
This was so long ago. Imagine so long ago to a child. It was my parents. How long ago was that? So long ago. Couldn't happen now. And um, it scares me what's going on as it scares all of you. I think as a child of survivors, it's even more frightening. And I heard uh, survivors say, never again is now. Um, it's just a very sad state of affairs. Neo-Nazi, anti-Semitism, discrimination, um, threats to our democracy, threats to our social justice. Uh, it's a very scary time. It's a dark time. I'm sorry to say that. So I, I can talk about something that has just appeared recently. I don't know if anybody or any one of you had seen the GOP tweet about, you know, gun, what the Democrats want to do is gun control. They came, they did that, and then, you know, that's what's going to happen to you. The picture is a pile of rings, of wedding rings of dead people from Auschwitz. So they compare this, you know, the taking of their their their, their the, the government wanting to control and reduce the gun violence. They compare this to like the Nazis, which enrages me to no end and shows me how the use of Nazi epitaphs by some people shows not only ignorance of what happened to the, in, during the Holocaust, but actually shows straight right anti-Semitism. So me as, as a second generation, I decided I cannot sit, sit idle by that. And I'm going to send letters to our legislators to show them again to, to note that these people, that they show these rings, they died because they didn't have arms. They died because they were unarmed and, and helpless. So the fact that you're going to get more guns, look what happened today. Look what happened this year alone. To today, 127, mass killings have been in this country. So, you know, for me, whenever you use a, a Nazi epitaph to justify your things to, for freedom, it shows me ignorance and it shows me really anti-Semitic anti -Semitic tendencies. I'm going to exercise my privilege as director now to uh, of the Center for Jewish Studies to to ask a question, um, the the final question. Um, so, I, a lot of the different contributions in in this this great work are marked by a kind of ambivalent relationship between with the parents, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about Fran. You're talking about your your. Uh, father responding to you wanting to write a dissertation, right? So, but, but there's, so there's this desire for their children or the families not to speak about it. At the same time, I can't help but feeling in many, if not all of the different reflections that for the, the children writing about this, this is also a profound, they're, they're doing this as a way of connecting with their parents, as a way of honoring their parents. So there's this disavowal and then this, this act of, of saying or, or disregarding the parental disavowal, but as an act of kind of engaging the parents. And I'm just curious if you might think about that, like what, what if you could say a little bit about how writing this was or was not and kind of related to, or a way of relating to your parents? An excellent question. I was very aware in writing this that my parents did not want information spread about them, about the Holocaust, and here I am today, right? It's going out to the world. 
and I worried about airing their dirty laundry. Um, but actually, the piece is an honoring of my parents. It's, you know, that the things that they did um, that they might not be proud of are so understandable given what they went through. And when I struggled with, is this a betrayal of my parents writing this? I decided, no, it's my truth and it's my experience. And I like to think, I mean, they were so against anything being shared about the Holocaust, but are knowing anything. But I tell my clients not to freeze people in the past. They might have evolved. They died before I was 30. I thought that I was the only one in our group who that I knew least about the Holocaust and my parents were the most closed. And actually, when you ask people in the group, they ask their parents in their 30s, in their 40s. So I didn't get that, but they might very well. I like to think that they'd be proud. I like to think that, that I'm sitting here now sharing this with you. Um, I think the writing of the stories for all of us um, was a way of healing. Um, you know, you construct a new narrative when you start reflecting back on your life and especially at this age. I think it's a gift actually to start writing about your experiences because we have that, you know, the, the wisdom that arises. If we would have been 40 when we were writing, it would have been a very different memoir than what it is right now. And um, I noticed for myself and for others, there was just a, a greater sense of compassion that we had in relationship to understanding our whatever our parents did in that terms of that experience. So I would encourage all of you <laughs> um, to just think about your own, you know, all families have their shtick. And, you know, uh, whether we choose to share that or not share that, but, and we all make, as our mothers all said to us, you know, when you grow up, you'll make your own mistakes with your children, right? Um, so that's, you know, a lot of times we were struggling as we were writing that how much is our experience related to the fact that our parents were Holocaust survivors, the fact that they were Jewish, or the fact that they were just families? Like, what is, what, what is developmentally? Um, appropriate or common or normative across our experience in relationship to other families. So it's a question. On my way to passing this to you, I'm going to stick in a, a little bit because I, I have the mic. Um, a gift of writing memoir is that you get to re-examine your life and you do it through eyes that are wiser, more experienced, and um, the growth that came from it for myself and when I talked to fellow authors um, was immense. It's a gift of memoir. Backing on that, uh, I would say that for me, the experience was starting when we suggested that we write our life stories, I, I, I was afraid. I was afraid to scratch these wounds, these scabs, lift them up and bring these these memories back to life but in retrospect it was a healing process it was somewhat if I can call cathartic it was you know it was a way for me to understand myself better and to forgive myself for the mistakes that I have made throughout life because I'm I'm this second generation. I'm also one of the uh, only two in our group that still have a surviving parent. My mother, though not in full mental capacity right now, um, still alive at the age of uh, 86 and a half. And she has read, actually, I have read my chapter to her. And even though her understanding and chronology, even though she helped me actually resurrect some, some of the history, she helped me with the store, her story and stuff like that. Right now she 
does not, she cannot follow it so correctly, but she was very proud of me of writing this chapter and, and you know, very supportive. Uh, she even came to one of, I made a, a, a presentation when I was in Israel over the summer and she came and was very proud of my story, so. So I would like to, uh, well, first of all, let's thank our panelists for this wonderful presentation. We will outside of the auditorium, there are some uh, refreshments. There are also going to be books uh, for sale if you would like to buy one and the, the authors will, will sign them uh, if you would like. So why don't we head out that way uh, towards the refreshments and, and thank you again for that wonderful presentation.